Scott before when we when we did the uh, interview before. That was your what you just. I'm going to have you repeat the story you just talked about downstairs on your only interaction with Robert Jackson, and maybe you can set it up by the fact that when you were at Mondorf Palace, you obviously quote befriended Robert Lay. Uh, he ended up being transported to Nuremberg, and then he felt obligated to say something. Right. Right. Okay, I'll start with that. Sure. Just, uh, um, as you know, my, my role at uh, my cover at Ashcan in Mundorf was, uh, of course, to pretend to be the welfare officer. Not only pretend, but I actually did it. And that gave me the opportunity to go into uh, each prisoner's room whenever I felt like it. And they all knew me. Uh, as you know, I didn't uh, use my proper name. I went by the name of Gillen, mm -hmm. John Gillen, because I still had relatives in Germany. So I uh, would go in and, and uh, just say, how are you today? How do you feel? Or any problems? Uh, I remember perhaps one of the most uh, significant and revealing experiences along that line was coming into General Field Marshal Keitel's one room one morning in his room, and he was sitting on the edge of his cot, and he was in obvious pain. Actually, he was just uh, pale with pain, and he had a, a big boil on his neck, and it was um, uh, it looked very dangerous, very threatening, and very painful. And I asked him immediately, he said, he, I hadn't been able to sleep all night, and I said, well, why didn't you call the guard? There was a guard in the hallway all night long. All you had to do was to call the guard, and the guard would summon the doctor and lance that boil, and you'd be comfortable. Well, that was absolutely beyond his uh, philosophy. He, the general field marshal, the equivalent of a five-star general, was not about to, to tell a, a buck private in the American army that he had a boil on his neck. <laughs> so he'd rather suffer all night. And that was typical of Keitel. He was a real stuffed shirt. Uh, others would uh, uh, very readily respond to even the, the mildest uh, act of kindness. Uh, they were busy writing letters to uh, President Truman and General Eisenhower and General Patton complaining about their, their treatment. And as welfare officer, I would sometimes uh, translate their letters. We sent them on through channels. And we never got any replies. I think they're still going through channels. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, lie was probably more dependent on the welfare officer than any of the other prisoners. Lai was almost like a little boy. He had been uh, a navigator in World War I, and his plane was shot down over France. And in the process, he suffered a severe head injury, with the result that he was in a coma for a couple of weeks. And when he recovered, he found that he had a very serious stammer. He stuttered when he spoke. And the first time he came into my room for an interrogation, um, the routine opening for an interrogation was, uh, if he heisens you, what is your name? And then what is your title, your occupation? And he started out uh, stuttering, Robert, uh, and I, I thought he was pulling my leg because I'd heard him speak on the radio and he had been, uh, a very a rabble rouser, but a very eloquent uh, rabble rouser. So I thought he was just being a smart aleck, and I reprimanded him. I said, you know, talk properly. And he got all red in the face and, and finally uh, told me that uh, about his injury in France and so forth. And then he rather wistfully said if I could give him a, uh, a shot of that good American bourbon, uh, that would loosen his tongue, and he'd be able to talk more fluently. Well, in the course of, of this relationship, I found that uh, he was really an alcoholic, and the other prisoners would tell me that whenever I got up to speak in public, he was drunk. I mean, otherwise, he, his stammer would have been very pronounced. <laughs> Anyhow, um, he found me very sympathetic, with the result that when we transported all of the, the prisoners to Luxembourg, to uh, Nuremberg from Luxembourg, we had a special airport because there was no place at uh, the C-47s. We had two of them that came up from, from uh, I think, from Spain that we had ordered to take the 19 high-ranking Nazis from Luxembourg to, to uh, Nuremberg. So they built an air, 
airport, a runway actually, on a cornfield way up on a high point in Mundorf. And uh, they used that runway just four times. Uh, for the planes to come in, they load up the prisoners to take them to Nuremberg, and then the empty planes to come back and bring me back to Luxembourg, and then planes took off back to Spain, and then the, the runway became a, a cornfield again. Uh, we were there last October, and we filmed that particular area, the runway, for this documentary film we're making. And it was quite a dramatic sight because uh, back in 1945, there was a path through this cornfield where the farmer had planted some uh, short uh, pear trees. Well, in the 50, 60 years, those pear trees have grown up. And now it is a beautiful LA of these pear trees. And last fall, we actually filmed me coming down between those pear trees wow. to reenact that scene when we took the, the prisoners away. Well, Lai went to Nuremberg, <coughs> and I went to Oberursel, Germany, which is a military intelligence service center. And I had been there, oh, probably about two or three weeks, uh, supervising a study of the German general staff. When uh, the commanding officer, uh, Colonel Philp, called me in, and he had a letter written in pencil addressed to Mr. First Lieutenant Gillen. Dear Mr. Honorable uh, Lieutenant Gillen, I have an important revelation to make uh, which will obviously affect the outcome of the trials and have much to do with the future of Germany. I trust you and you are the only one to whom I will give this information. Kind of a rough quote of what was in that, that note. Signed, Robert Lai. A Reich Minister addressed to First Lieutenant John Gillen, United States Army. Well, that letter made the, the tour through the channels until somebody found out that Gillen was Dollar Boy, and it ended up in Oberursel at our Military Intelligence Service Center. Well, the commanding officer then sent me on six days temporary duty to Nuremberg to get this important information from Lai. <laughs> and, that, and that trip to Nuremberg actually had to be authorized by Justice Jackson because he was the guy in charge of the, that whole uh, state prison in Nuremberg. Not only the prison cells, but also the courtroom and, and the witness wing and everything else. So with his authorization, I went to Nuremberg to get that information. I went to visit Lai in his cell and asked him what the information was. Oh, he said, uh, it's much too long, I can't give it to you orally, I have to write it down. Well, that meant that uh, it would take some time for him to write it down. I didn't want to stay that long in Germany, in Nuremberg. So I asked Colonel Andrews to just uh, let me take some paper and a pencil to him and let him write it out, and then I would come back when he had it written, when I had written what he was going to tell me. So I went back to Oberursel, uh, until a, almost a week or two later, I got permanent orders to go to Nuremberg, which is the last thing I wanted. But uh, Colonel Andrews had been able to pull the right strings, and I ended up in Nuremberg on permanent assignment. And I saw myself being there till the end of the trials, and that's the last thing I wanted. I wanted to come home and uh, to my wife and our son. Well, <clears throat> Lai had written this out, and I read it, and I thought it was a little bit funny because so far-fetched, unrealistic. His plan was actually, his revelation was his plan for the reconstruction of Germany with himself in charge. Uh, he would stay uh, in the prison cell willingly, providing, of course, we would fix it up a little more comfortably. But he would direct the operation of, of rebuilding Germany and um, commerce and, and transportation and everything else. And he would bring back as his assistants all the Jews who had been exiled, who left uh, as refugees and were now elsewhere, United States, Great Britain, or wherever, and bring them back and, and uh, have them help him in the reconstruction of Germany giving back to them the property that had been seized, their assets. 
and thereby making concessions and uh, making up for the bad feelings that uh, the German government had created. <laughs> because he said uh, the biggest mistake that Hitler made was the persecution of the Jews, who could now uh, help in the reconstruction. That was his plan. Well, I, through our channels, that, that plan then arrived at just on Justice Jackson's desk. And I was summoned to Justice Jackson's office. And that was the only time I had eyeball to eyeball conversation with him as I translated that document, or the, the high points of that document to him in about six or seven pages. And of course, he shook his head and said, uh, that's ridiculous, you know, this, this could never go, and never fly. So it was my job then to go back and tell Lai <clears throat> that his plan was not acceptable to the Allied authorities and uh, just forget about it. Well, he, he just um, went into hysterics. He just threw himself up uh, against the wall of his cell and stretched out his arms and said, well, in that case, you, you might as well shoot me right now. I, I have nothing to live for. I don't even want to stand trial, and he just carried on. In fact, we had to call the doctor to calm him down. When I reported this to Colonel Andrews, he, he put a 24-hour guard on Lai's cell. At that time, we had the guard just parading up and down, checking each cell. But from there on in, uh, with Lai threatening suicide, and uh, Health Minister Conti, who had been Hitler's uh, a personal surgeon and also a, a health minister, uh, Leonardo Conti, C-O-N-T-I, had committed suicide successfully, hanging himself in his cell. Consequently, we put a guard in front of each door 20, 24 hours long. Not the same guard, but uh, guards would be on duty one hour and then change. So we had a guard watching live. And he acted very strangely, pacing his cell according to the guard's report. But on the 25th of October, as I recall, I was a duty officer that night. And uh, about 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, the alarm went off. I was summoned by the guards. The guards could not go into a cell. They didn't have any keys. <clears throat> Consequently, the duty officer had the key that fit all the cells, the master key. So I came running when the guard summoned me and opened the cell and found Lai um, dead. Uh, I sent for the doctor, who of course made the official confirmation. Dr. Flücker, who is a, a German doctor, took care of the prisoners. Lai had uh, undercover in his cot, even though the guard was watching him but couldn't see him, uh, ripped his underwear and stuffed it in his mouth so he wouldn't gag. Uh, he had ripped uh, the edge of his towel, made a noose out of it, put it around his neck, and then he signaled the guard that he wanted to use the toilet. And in each cell there was a niche where there was a toilet, and when the prisoner sat on the toilet, the guard from the door could only see his feet. So that was the only time uh, a prisoner would be out of the guard's sight. Right. Lai um, went to this niche slipped that noose over the standpipe. There was a button to flush the toilet, which was just the height uh, from the floor whereby he could sit on the toilet and by leaning forward forcefully, uh, strangle himself, which is what he did. The guard who could only see his feet after a while asked him to, uh, you know, are you finished? And of course, when he didn't get any answer, he set off the alarm because uh, obviously, there was something wrong. So Lai was pronounced dead. They did an autopsy on him, and they did found that uh, one of the brain cells, the lober, uh, was was injured as a result of that crash during World War One, and it was defective, which had affected his his outlook and his behavior, as well as his voice. So he was almost like a child. Yeah. Um, yet was a very influential rabble-rouser for Hitler. Sure. He had participated in a putsch in 1923, and he had um, 
written uh, a book entitled uh, Wir alle helfen dem Führer. We all help the Führer. That was the book he put out, which is a sort of an adulation of Hitler, um, indicating and it's a sort of flattering thing that Hitler would really like. And that endeared him to Hitler, too, in addition to his being one of the, the old comfort, the old fighters. So. But that's a story of a lie. Wow. <laughs> he was buried. <clears throat> he was buried in, wrapped in brown paper, wrapping paper, and put in an ordinary wooden box. And two uh, German grave diggers in a pauper's cemetery dug his grave. And they just dumped him out of the box because uh, they could take the box home for kindling. So um, he didn't even have a coffin. He was wrapped in brown paper and just dumped. Um, I learned afterwards, as the story was repeated, that he actually landed in a grave uh, on his stomach. So he was buried on his stomach. Probably the only person's ever been buried that way. So. That was the end of lie, the labor front leader. <laughs> Going. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Thank you for all you've done for us. Okay. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Doc. We're Thank good. You so nice much. meeting you. I hope to see you again sometime. I hope so. Thank you. All right. Now, that was one suicide. We've kind of dealt with, with Dr. Conti, with, with Robert Lay, and now we got Gehring. Hammond Gehring. Yeah. He's the only, uh, only the third <clears throat> of the very prominent of the Nazi leaders who uh, succeeded in, in committing suicide. Uh, Goering uh, was a drug addict. Uh, he had become addicted to morphine uh, when he was shot in a groin in uh, 1923, when he stood next to Hitler in Munich during the putsch. Being addicted to morphine, of course, he is a lifetime addiction. And he had, uh, during his regime as the Reich Marshal, uh, had been in a tank several times, drying up and uh, uh, getting treatment. And what he was actually taking to help him overcome, not overcome, but control the addiction of morphine, was paracodine. And uh, paracodine, I understand, is like a, a mild Valium. He must have commandeered the entire supply of uh, paracodine in all of Germany, because when he arrived in Mundorf, he had a, a suitcase completely filled with these paracodine tablets, and he chewed them like M&Ms. He took uh, between 20 and 40 every day, morning and at night. Our Dr. Flücker broke him of the habit by reducing the daily, of course, we confiscated the, the pills, but just reducing the, the daily amount that, that he issued to him. And that, of course, uh, <clears throat> in six months' time, Goering had overcome this addiction to paracodine, with the result that he actually was in better health after six months in, in prison, both at Nuremberg and Luxembourg, than he had been for a long, long time. He lost uh, over 100 pounds. He weighed 280 pounds when we took him prisoner, and weighed 180 when the trial started. He was pretty proud of himself, feeling that uh, as he cracked, wisecracked one time, that prison life was really good for his health because it helped him lose weight. And also, he regained his strength and overcome his uh, paracodine addiction. When he was taken prisoner, he had a capsule of paracodine embedded in a capsule of potassium cyanide embedded in one of the paracodine tablets. He also had one buried in a cigarette. He had a, a big box of uh, um, cigarettes, Turkish cigarettes, and he had one of these um, potassium cyanide capsules in a cigarette. Goering was sentenced to death by hanging, along with uh, 10 other, other prisoners. And one hour before he was to be hanged, when they went into his cell to uh, bring him to the gallows, he was dead. He had produced a capsule of potassium cyanide, 
um, like the two that we had uh, confiscated, and managed to uh, take it. He was dead within 15 seconds, uh, potassium cyanide being extremely effective. This, of course, started a big investigation of where did this, where did he get the third uh, capsule of uh, potassium cyanide? On his body was a little cartridge of a pistol. And we had learned by that time that any of the high-ranking Nazis uh, who were very important were all issued this little pistol cartridge with potassium cyanide in it with the instructions that if taken prisoner, take this and cheat the hangman or the trials. Don't be taken alive. So you could tell how important the guy was by whether or not he had the capsule of potassium cyanide. Consequently, there, there was investigation of where did Goering get it when all of them had been searched, not just once, but every week. Uh, unannounced, there was a, a search of the, the cell and their clothing and even their body cavities uh, in case they might be hiding one of these capsules, especially after the, the other two successful suicides. Well, it seemed that um, going, well, uh, I got sidetracked there. One of these cartridges was lying on his stomach, and that particular cartridge turned up uh, in the possession of an American officer whose name was uh, Tex Wheelis uh, from Texas. He was a first lieutenant assigned to the guard detachment at the prison. It turned out, as a result of interrogation, um, that this Tex Wheelis had somewhat befriended Goering. He admired him and vice versa. They were both interested in hunting and fishing and of course, Goering had been the hunt master of Germany, so he liked this young man. Well, this particular cartridge turned out to be in, in a possession of uh, the widow of Tex Wheelers, and a, a, a gentleman uh, from Dallas, Texas, uh, collected Nazi memorabilia and ended up with a the cartridge that I'm talking about, which held the potassium of cyanide with which Goering committed suicide. This started him investigating, and he took a year off from his work. He was an elementary school principal, and he decided to investigate interrogating people who'd been at Nuremberg and, and uh, people who um, knew all of the guard element. And he pieced together a book which he wrote the, in 1985, The Mystery of Hermann Goering's Suicide. And the mystery was that on the day they were to be hanged, the prisoners, Goering found out that they were to be hanged that day, although they hadn't been told ahead of time. Um, we think that Flücker, the doctor, the German doctor, had told him. He knew. So Goering sent for Tex Wheelers, Lieutenant Wheelers, and asked him to bring him a jar of cold cream because um, Goering suffered from some kind of a, a skin problem. And he had this special prescription of cold cream, which was kept in his personal belongings. And he, can, he, he persuaded uh, Lieutenant Wheelers to bring him his cold cream, which he needed for uh, his face, for his uh, skin problem. And Wheelers brought it to him, which is what uh, the author of this book um, discovered. Is that Swearingen? <coughs> ben Swearingen, yes. Um, ben Swearingen discovered this through interrogating people and finding out a lot of what was going on. Sp Swearingen, incidentally, uh, I, I know him personally, in his collection had the typewriter on which Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. And he also had a piece of upholstery about so big, with a spot of blood on it, which came from the couch on which Hitler sat when he committed suicide in a bunker, and the blood was Hitler's blood. Uh, he had bought that from a GI who had bought it from a Russian 
who had liberated the bunker and who had cut up the couch in pieces, selling it to the Americans for cigarettes and, and whiskey and watches. And this lieutenant, uh, this uh, GI bought this swatch and sold it to Ben Swearing and part of the collection, thing, which is quite a, a national enterprise. There are collectors of Nazi, Nazi memorabilia all over the country. Anyhow, the capsule of potassium cyanide in the cartridge was buried in a jar of cold cream. Now, whether Tex Wheelers knew that the poison was in the cold cream is moot. I mean, nobody could ever prove that. But he was sympathetic in bringing the, uh, the cold cream to Goering for his skin problem. And I would give him the benefit of the doubt and say he, he didn't know that uh, the poison was in the cold cream. So. But that's the mystery of Hermann Goering's suicide. There's a lot of other speculation, but uh, this comes the closest to the truth, what really happened. You had a chance to uh, <coughs> spend some, uh, uh, do you want some water? Any water or anything? Do you anything to drink? Yeah, yeah I would really love that. Seems to me I, I read in here about, uh, you were in the courtroom at the time of the Rudolf Hearst, um, he was in the court, and now he was, of course, the, uh, the commandant of Auschwitz. Of Auschwitz, yeah. yeah. Uh, the affidavit that was used was uh, Whitney Harris was involved in getting that affidavit. Right. So it kind of tied in. Uh, I mean, here's a guy just about as bad as it, it got, as far as it, at least, or his testimony was about as revealing as it could possibly be. You, you want to comment a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Hess was Rudolf Hess. H-O-E-S-S, -S, and many, many people who uh, knew of, of that section of the, uh, that uh, segment of the trial, and also knew about uh, Rudolf Hess, H-E-S-S, -S, flight to England, have always confused the two. <laughs> I know uh, in speeches I have given, if I talked about Rudolf Hess uh, flying to England, um, people would immediately question and say, well, uh, how did he end up being the commandant of Auschwitz if he was in England? Well, um, I always had a lot of fun clearing that up, that there's a difference between Rudolf Hess and Rudolf Hess, and uh, that itself uh, lends to a lecture. I happened to be in the courtroom as a visitor uh, after I left Nuremberg again uh, about, or oh, shortly after um, Lai committed suicide. I, su I succeeded in being transferred back to Oberursel for the simple reason there really wasn't anything for me to do because intelligence had stopped having contact with the prisoners and the indictments had been served so there was really nothing for interrogators to do. Consequently, uh, 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 Colonel Andrews, Burton Andrews, appointed me his special assistant, and that meant continuing the role of welfare officer, but most importantly acting as an interpreter for the prison psychiatrist who couldn't speak the you know, American major uh, from the University of California, who was a professor of psychiatry, and he performed all of the uh, Rorschach analysis inkblot test on all the prisoners, but he couldn't speak German. so. What little time I had left in Nuremberg, I acted as his interpreter, which is very interesting because I really got to know the, the psyche of, of the prisoners, and, and that gave me an inside look at, that I really appreciated having, although at the time, I didn't take advantage of it. I didn't realize what a, a minefield of uh, information I was gathering. Well, when I, I left then to go back to Oberursel, finally, being fed up to here with interrogations and Nazis. I've been doing that for uh, literally almost two years and got tired of it, very tired of it. But I was finishing a project entitled The History of the German General Staff. So occasionally I had to go back to Nuremberg uh, over a weekend uh, or just a day or two to interrogate uh, uh, General Blaskowitz, who was um, a commandant in Poland and also General Warlimont, uh, Walter Warlimont, 
who was the deputy chief of operations and a very cooperative uh, prisoner. Uh, I kept in touch with his family uh, long after the war because uh, uh, he spoke English fluently and had voluntarily surrendered to us and, and revealed a lot of information, particularly about the German general staff, of which he was a, uh, the equivalent of a four-star general, a, a general of the artillery. <clears throat> well, when I came back then to interrogate, interview really, these general officers, I had an opportunity, because I had a pass uh, to the courtroom uh, and also a pass to the uh, prisoners, uh, war criminals wing. So I could, if I wanted to, uh, visit the prisoners, although I didn't want to get involved. But I did go to the courtroom and into the witness wing to see some of my old uh, victims from Luxembourg. And in doing so, I, I just sit in the courtroom back where, in the visitors' gallery and watch the proceedings. And I saw Justice Jackson um, interrogate, or, or rather, uh, interview Goering on uh, one time, which is very interesting. And it was, I think it was the first session, and they were having a tete-a-tete, -tete, um, back and forth, and uh, the Chief Justice of the court had a rule several times to point out to Goering that the Soviet Union was not on trial, because Goering kept insisting to Justice Jackson, why do you have a, um, a Soviet judge judging us when they committed more crimes than we Germans ever did? And they thought us, taught us about concentration camps and executions. And the judge um, had to rule that uh, the Soviets were not on trial. And he was out of order. I, I, I saw that interchange, exchange. I found it very interesting. Well, coming back to your question, uh, which Pretty I've been even... Fascinating stuff. <clears throat> Pardon? That's yeah. fascinating stuff. Uh, yeah, but uh, coming back to it, one of the sessions that I was able to witness was Rudolf Huss, the commandant of Auschwitz. And that was a hair-raising experience because uh, he was a guy who admitted everything. He didn't deny anything. And he went into the morbid detail of what went on at, at Auschwitz, how they actually herded the women and children into the baths, which actually turned out to be the gas chambers and, and turned on, on the cyclone. And uh, his description of that was as if he were telling a fairy story. I mean, he was just uh, not the least bit uh, repentant. His excuse was, yes, we did this, and it was horrible, but we obeyed orders. And I was just a soldier obeying orders. And my orders were to do this, so we did it. And he said, my reward, my promotions, uh, were dependent on how many people we successfully executed, exterminated. And so the more we could kill, the better I looked. So we killed as many as we could. And he was not ashamed of it. Uh, and, and he explained how, in answer to I'm not sure whether it was the French prosecutor or whether it was Justice Jackson. I think it was the French prosecutor. How come there were some survivors? That there were actually people now who could say, I was an inmate of Auschwitz. And her smiled and said, well, that was, must mean they were in very good health. Because if they were in good health, we put them in, in, in the workforce. And they worked in, in, uh, in, in uh, pounding rocks. Uh, breaking up uh, paving stones um, in the quarries, the stone quarries, or the cement factories, or they worked on the farms. But if they were in bad health or crippled and they couldn't work, then they were exterminated. So he said, smiling, if you meet a survivor, it means um, he was in good enough health uh, not to be executed. And that was just a matter of fact explanation. But old men, old women, children, women, who were of no use to them, were just automatically put into the chambers. They would arrive by train, come off the train, and just heard, strip their clothes. And he'd explain how to get the gold out of their teeth, 
shaved him completely, saved the hair for commercial mattress stuffing. And, and it was just uh, people in, in the courtroom were crying, shaking their heads. And it was just a matter of fact affair with him. Uh, he, he was quite a repulsive character. What was your reaction? Could you see the judges? What was their... Were they, were they well, the, uh, amazingly enough, the judges managed to uh, keep a, a stone face most of the time. Uh, it was kind of interesting to, to watch that. It was, uh, they, they didn't commit themselves, which, um, of course, a, a good judge won't do anyhow. He's not going to indicate how guilty he thinks uh, uh, a prisoner is by, by laughing or smiling or nodding his head. So the judges pretty much uh, kept a neutral face, uh, except when they got angry. <clears throat> Going back to Ashcan for a second, there's a very famous picture of the class of 1945. And you were there, but not in the, you were <laughs> kind of in the picture, but you weren't. Well, I was, um, one reason we were able to do our work at Ashcan is that there was no media hounding us because the media worldwide had no idea where these high-ranking Nazis were. As I said earlier, there was a lot of speculation. People were guessing where they were, but nobody guessed that they were in Luxembourg. And, um, and this is why Luxembourg had been chosen, because it was off the beaten path, small country, especially this uh, this little town of Mundorf, which was a health resort, a spa. So nobody knew about it. And we were able to work without being interviewed by the press. CNN had not been invented yet, so uh, they weren't able to find us either. <clears throat> so uh, it wasn't until the latter part of the summer when former inmates of concentration camps were released and were brought to Mundorf to recuperate uh, from their, excuse me, from their hardships and, and, the, and the punishment um, as slave laborers and as, as concentration camp inmates. When they were liberated and they were brought to Mundorf at the expense of the Luxembourg government and were treated to the cure, drinking the mineral water, getting massages and enjoying the park, uh, the park Anlage with the uh, beautiful flowers and trees and river. And so they were recouping their health. Well, it didn't take them long to find out who was on the other side of the barbed wire fence, that this were obviously the high-ranking Nazis. And a lot of these people would occasionally organize a little bit of a, a parade up the back of the compound, uh, which was uh, barred with a, a, a defense, barbed wire fence, and camouflage nets. And, and they would sing the, uh, the horse wrestle song with, in Luxembourgish with their own ver uh, uh, version of the horse wrestle song, which wasn't like the, uh, some of it was pretty indecent and obscene. And they would drive the, the Nazis crazy because they'd be sitting on the veranda and these Luxembourgers would walk by singing the horse vessel song, their version of it. And the Nazis would immediately jump up and, and go out of earshot inside the building or around the back of it so they wouldn't hear it. Well, it stands to reason with these Luxembourgers being on hand, knowing who was there, that it would eventually leak out. So the press did in time find out that the, the Nazis were in Luxembourg. So then we were inundated with uh, reporters from all over the world who wanted information and we'd have press conferences and tell the story. And I had to appear, especially for the Luxembourg media, because I could speak Luxembourgish and explain to Luxembourg people too that we were, that these guys weren't getting the deluxe treatment inside the luxurious hotel, that they were sleeping on army cots and straw mattresses and GI blankets and they had barbed wire uh, they had uh, uh, iron bars on the windows, as well as plexiglass instead of glass. And so uh, that was a relationship. Anyhow, Time Magazine was among the, the media elements. And they sent a photographer 
And apparently, uh, Colonel Andrews was either partial or he flipped the coin, but he gave them permission to take one picture. None of the press were allowed to take pictures inside. They could only be interviewed, interview us for, on the outside. They weren't allowed to come in and interview the prisoners and, or talk to them or take pictures. But Time Magazine was allowed to take one group picture, which then appeared in the, if I remember correctly, November 7, 1945 uh, issue of Time Magazine. And they called it, uh, with tongue in cheek, the class of 1945. And they took a group picture of the entire uh, bunch that we had. I think at that time there were 56 of them who were still left. Others had been released because they weren't important enough to keep any longer. Well, I was in charge of lining them up for this picture. And I was in a back row to give the photographer the signal when they were ready. And, and then it occurred to me that if I could just, and it occurred to me much later, that if I had stood up in the back row, my picture would have been along with the group. I would have been there, right, standing next to Grand Admiral Dönitz, who uh, was in the back row very modestly. And um, I stood next to him, but I ducked down after I gave the uh, cameraman the signal. And I've regretted that ever since, because if I had uh, just stayed there, my, my picture would have been along with the, uh, the class of 1945, and that would have been a lasting. But I was, I was too much of a coward at that time uh, to take a chance of uh, having Colonel Andrews mad at me or something. So, But that issue of uh, Time magazine is still in the, in the archives somewhere. And uh, it was reproduced in a book just a couple of years ago about the history of Mundorf. And they reproduced, reproduced some of my book uh, and translated it into French. So about uh, five or six chapters of my book uh, have been translated into French and incorporated in the history of Mundorf, which is a, a thick book, uh, very interesting. Because Mundorf goes back to Roman times. It was founded by the, the Romans. And this fabulous mineral water that they have was, a, was actually a discovery of the Romans, who had uh, come that fella up as far as Trier, Treve in Germany, and of course uh, all through Europe. And there are a lot of artifacts of um, the Roman legions going back 2,000 years around the Mundorf area. Uh, Winnie and I hiked uh, on several Roman roads that were built in, in the year 121 AD. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, a village named Dalheim, uh, which is a, a very interesting place. And one occasion, incidentally, and I didn't mention this in my book because I didn't know about it, believe it or not, where von Papen and Goering and, uh, let's see, Ar Admiral Horthy, the region of Hungary, and two or three others, uh, Jamar Schacht uh, yeah, and Baldur von Schirag, they were taken to a villa in Dalheim. And the impression was given, and this had been arranged by the OSS, uh, General Wild Bill Donovan, uh, with uh, permission from Colonel Andrews, that they would take these important prisoners and pretend that they were taking them back to Germany. And so they put them on ambulances, and, and they were the back window of the ambulance, military ambulance, closed. They couldn't see where they were going. And they rode them around uh, for hours, making them think that they were being taken from Luxembourg to Germany. And then they ended up in this village of Dalheim, about 15 minutes away from Mundorf. Yeah, and they put them up in this villa, uh, very classy, beautiful. I mean, not uh, li living really in great style with uh, uh, the beds and the furnishings and and they got good meals, and they even had alcoholic beverages, wine and champagne with their meals. They were given the impression that they were being released. They'd been brought back to Germany, and in due time would be sent to their homes. And then they were allowed to walk in the garden and, and talk. And we had microphones outside in the trees, because they knew how to uh, you know, sweep a room. So it wasn't safe to have a 
hidden mics in the rooms because they would discover that and get suspicious. But they did have microphones in the trees outside. And so when these guys would go for a walk and sit under a tree and talk, that would be all recorded. That was picked up. Well, as it turned out, the weather turned bad the next day. And it rained cats and dogs, so they couldn't go outside. And there wasn't much sense in keeping them inside because we were whining and dining them and there was nothing to benefit from. So they put them back in the ambulance and in 15 minutes, they were, uh, five minutes, they were back in, in, the, in the Grand Hotel in, in Luxembourg. So uh, they realized then that they hadn't been in Germany at all. But Goering, the loudmouth, even bragged and said that he thought he recognized this place. He, <laughs> he, uh, he remembered having been there once before and uh, getting a Goering exclusive. Yeah. Did, did, you, did your past uh, cross at all with Bill Donovan's? Oh, very much so, yeah. He was actually our coach. Uh, he, he is the one who um, talked to us about the psychology of interrogation. And, and we relied on, on Donovan to be more or less our... Um, uh, he, he was a colonel. He, he had just been made brigadier, fortunately, because he outranked Colonel Andrews. And what's important here is that Colonel Andrews was really a prison warden, professionally, mm -hmm. I mean military. And he had been the warden of several military prisons in the United States, which were, which were housing soldiers who had committed crimes anywhere from rape, murder, and so on. They'd been tried and punished in a military court, and then he was the, the warden of that prison, which is why he was chosen to be the commandant of Ashcan. The problem with Andrews was that he thought, he interpreted this to mean that these people had all been, they were tried and found guilty, and they were now being punished, and he was in charge, and he treated them accordingly. But they were brought there to be interrogated, not to be punished, because they hadn't been tried yet. So we had problems at first, because uh, the way he treated the prisoners, like they had to stand and salute him, uh, but he didn't have to return a salute. So whenever he came into a room, they had to snap to attention. And if they, they didn't obey all his regulations, they were put in solitary confinement with bread and water, that kind of stuff. Well, then if we tried to interrogate those guys, we ran into a stone wall. And uh, we'd say, yeah, you know, we can't interrogate guys who've been antagonized by uh, Colonel Andrews. Well, we were not under his command. And we, we, had, we had to obey his regulations, but we were not responsible to him. We were responsible to Colonel Phil, military intelligence. So we had no one to appeal to except General Donovan. So when Donovan came to Luxembourg to talk to us about a certain prisoner, and he coached us on what to get out of him and what to ask him and how to limber him up. And uh, so we could cry on his shoulder and tell him that Andrews is making it hard for us. So then he would have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with, with Andrews. And eventually, we convinced Andrews that uh, how this thing really was supposed to work. And, these guys were innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. What kind of guy was that? Oh, he was a very uh, interesting, adventurous type of guy. Uh, you had to admire him, uh, enjoyed him. Uh, he let you know who was boss. He was very, uh, well, I, I like to say he had a, a close crop personality. I mean, he was very, very military. But he was more political than military, really. But. Uh, he, had, he was close to Truman, and uh, he was sort of, you might compare him to an ambassador at large nowadays. And when, when Donovan spoke, uh, a lot of people listened, and, and he was able to open a lot of doors, uh, make, made our job easy for us. Yeah. Ironically, he's from Buffalo, New York, and of course he and Jackson ended up in, you know, Butting heads, but at a very high position. Oh yeah, for both yeah, yeah. Both Western New York guys. It was yeah, well, this is what I mean by <clears throat> uh, Donovan was pretty bossy. You know, as I say, he was you. You couldn't negotiate with him very well. That's what happened, and of course Jackson outranked him, and next thing you know, Donovan's on his way back. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> but then of course became the founder of the CIA, and the first director of the CIA, incidentally, was a Miami University graduate whom I knew quite well. 
Admiral Sidney W. Sowers. Uh, he became Donovan's successor, uh, the first director of the CIA. That's a, so it's a small world, a pattern of circles. Exactly, and that's a good way to end. Right. Not only is my tape ending, my battery's ending, but we you guys And when he's been going like this, it's my voice is ending. Thank you. This is perfect. Thank you for letting him do this. Letting him do this. I know you're the boss. I know you're the boss.